Some companies will promote you when they think you're ready to start trying out a new role, effectively trusting you based on past performance and past growth that you've shown. And other companies will only promote you once you've acted the new role for quite some time already, awarding you for having shown that you can handle the new role sustainably. But no matter how you will become a manager, the skills that got you this new role are not the same skills you need to stay in this role. If you haven't seen my previous video on what leadership is, I highly recommend you to watch that one, because this video builds on that one. This video is part one of how to become an engineering manager, because most companies don't have some handbook you can simply follow. Let's get into it. The first chapter is called Just Start, because you'll never be fully ready, and that's okay. Most people cannot learn to ride a bike just by watching other people ride a bike. That's not how learning works. In theory, you could read all the right books just to get yourself as ready as possible. But in practice, it's not going to work that way. It's not going to help you that much. These skills that you learn need to be practiced right away. I'm not saying reading the right books isn't helpful, because it is. I'm saying start to practice right away. Most of the theory that you consume needs to be put into practice immediately for it to stick, for you to not forget about it. Luckily, it's quite easy to start with one-on-ones. Whenever you and your manager have decided to give it a go, this is where I recommend you to start. From the foundation of the one-on-one -on -one meeting. Don't change anything else about your job yet. Just schedule one-on-ones with the people that in the future will report to you and start having those meetings. And then don't change anything else about your job for now. The rest will slowly change over time. The one-on-ones will give you so much insights that will change your job. You can learn to achieve most of your objectives in a one-on-one -on -one meeting. But for people who have delivered output as code for all those years, how is all this talking? How is it working? But it is work. It's very important work. It's like taking care of your car. The car is the thing that gets you from A to B, sure. But the car itself needs work as well. The car itself needs maintenance. The one-on-one -on -one meeting is the maintaining the people that report to you. As a manager, you are the maintainer of the people. You need to take care of the people, develop them, grow them, so they can get you where you want to be. And taking care of the people mainly happens in one-on-one -on -one meetings. Let's talk about the details of the one-on-one -on -one meeting next. Depending on the number of people you have, I recommend to schedule them recurrently. Just put them in your calendar, either weekly or every two weeks. These are your most important meetings from now on. But it can be quite daunting to have your first one-on-one. -on -one. What will you talk about? What if you have nothing to talk about? What if you fall silent? The goal of the one-on-one -on -one is people development. And the way of achieving that is by coaching them. And coaching is really, in principle, it's two things. It's listening, really, really trying to understand them. And it's asking questions. It's giving direction by asking questions. It's trying to make them think. It's not by giving them all the answers. One of the most important mind shifts that every manager has to make is that you can't make people change. You can only show them the door, but they are the ones who have to open it. And you do this by listening. You do this by empathizing. Empathy is defined as understanding and entering into another's feelings. It's derived from ancient Greek and it means to suffer with. In one-on-ones, you ask them how they're doing. You ask them what the fun parts of their job are, which people they work efficiently together with, which people not so efficient, which parts of their job are very frustrating, which are sometimes other people. You try to really get to know them. You try to get to know their whole self. This is a concept from the book Crucial Conversations. It is getting to know also somebody's hobbies, somebody's private life, somebody's values and somebody's motivators. The moment you have access to those, the moment somebody dares to be vulnerable with you, you can really help them a lot better. You need a certain level of psychological safety to get to know their whole self. You need to be very careful not to judge them because when they try to be vulnerable with you, they're most honest with you. And this means that through coaching, you can help them best. As a manager, there's four primary ways to create engagement. The first one is to communicate the past, present and the future of your company. That means where are we now with our product? What is the, the context of the market right now? Where are we going with our product? Where have we been before? Which causes these kind of skills and capabilities that we have as a company. But now that we want to go there, we need to develop these kind of skills. You're showing them the future. This creates context and this creates meaning and purpose for people. 
The second thing is to make it clear to people what success in their role looks like. This is a very important instrument to give direction to people. And the third one is to acknowledge success and confront with feedback. Acknowledging success can be done in private, but it can also be done in public. Giving the right compliment at the right time to the right person, even in a larger group, can be a very important instrument. It can give people direction. Like what are you as a manager valuing? Why are you giving this compliment? You are giving away why you value that certain thing. Suddenly other people will realize, ah, that's what that manager values. They might start chasing that same thing as well. And feedback needs to be done in private and it needs to be done with positive intent. And the fourth primary way to create engagement is by giving people a voice, by giving them a forum, by really listening to them. If something's happened in their private lives and it affects their work life, they're now a bit less productive because, you know, something happened, just be there for them, just listen to them. Say it is okay that they're dropping a bit in productivity. Don't go hammer on top of that because that is not taking care of the people. If you will then start to judge them on their productivity, they might start looking for another job. They might think you're a bad manager for not actually caring about their story. And we do all of these things in the one-on-one -on -one meeting. Becoming a good people manager is the art of making the most of your one-on-ones. In addition to running effective one-on-ones, becoming an engineering manager requires a whole list of secondary skills. I'll highlight a few that personally help me the most. The first one is note-taking or building a second brain. The brain is very good at having ideas, is very bad at storing them. So you need some other place to store them. Pick a system like Notion, Obsidian or Roam. There's more out there, but these are very famous ones that I think are pretty high quality. In that system, you need to store three things. You need to store raw data, you need to store a knowledge base, and you need to have a to-do list. These are the minimal things I would recommend everybody to start with. You can grow from there. You could literally make three folders for these, one for each. Let's talk about raw data first. I call this meeting notes. During meetings, this is where you jot down. You create an entry for every meeting. This is where you start writing down thoughts, things that were said, things you want to remember, actions, anything that you, that you just have to write down quickly, you'll get to it later because your main point is pay attention to the meeting. You want to be there. You want to actively be engaged in the discussion. But when you, but when something important happens, you need to write it down because it's too important to be, to be lost. You're effectively creating a raw log of notes and scribbles uh, only readable to you. And that's okay. Then a few times per week or once per day, you sit down and you process that raw data. You distill actions from them and you distill insights from them. Actions literally go to your to-do list and insights are things that improve your understanding. That is good to have read it again. Now I realize this, it may also become an action or you may you know, think about the long term at some point and have a new realization. The second folder or section is the knowledge base. This is where you build your second brain. This is where you put things that you don't want to actively keep in your head all the time. You don't want to remember them actively. You want to be able to access this easily. I've shown quite a few examples in my video on productivity on how I use my Notion setup and specifically this knowledge base section, which in my case is called articles. If you want some more examples of this, please take a look at that one. And the third one is a to-do list. And in the beginning, don't go too fancy with this. Just have a plain list of text or bullets. And th the priority is simply the order. And if you want to mark an item as done, delete it, delete the line. This can get you started right away. There's a few important insights about to-do lists. You need to have a limit. Uh, the limit can be 10 or 20 or whatever, but don't make it too big. Because if to-do lists like email boxes and, and whatever become too big, then you're not going to look at them anymore. You're never going to do all the items. So it becomes of less value. And at some point you'll stop using it. Anything that takes less than a few minutes to do, don't write it down, just do it. It shouldn't even enter your to-do list. And the last one is that you need to look at your to-do list daily. You need to reorder things daily and you need to delete items daily. Yes, delete. If it's on your to-do list, why would you delete it? Because I have many IDs and I'm never going to execute all of them. Priorities change all the time. IDs that I have today, maybe when I look at them tomorrow are, you know, not that important. And as a manager, you will quickly have way too much things to do. So you need to prioritize and deleting or delegating to somebody else, which is also deleting from your list is a very important activity of managers. Otherwise you just get bogged down and won't get the important things done. 
The next secondary skill I want to talk about is managing up. As a manager, you will also have a manager and you need to build a relationship of trust with this person, the same as you are building a relationship of trust with your own reports. And you want this professional relationship to be good because you need to align on goals. You need to receive a lot of information from them and you need to provide a lot of information to them. But if you want to align in a nice way, then you'll be told what to do in a less than nice way. The less trust you have, the more there's a chance of being micromanaged. And the more trust you have, the more autonomy you can have as a manager. And that's just job satisfaction. And the next secondary skill is being an example. As a leader, people look up to you. They might see themselves in you a few years from now. You need to show exemplary behavior. That means that if your company introduces new ways of working, attempts at culture change or a new piece of software, that you become the flag carrier. You are the one that decides to be progressive. You're the one that's not going to moan about change. You adopt it with positivity. It's a role model thing. If you are engaged, they will be engaged. If you decide to moan about it, they will decide to moan about it. And then there are many secondary activities which I call operational management. Your company might have a yearly performance cycle, so you might need to gather feedback and write an assessment. There's approving things like vacations, conferences and writing hours in a system. There's hiring, there's onboarding, there's offboarding. But luckily all of these things don't become the meat of your job. They're usually a very small part of your job. And the last thing I want to talk about is learning materials. Content you can consume by yourself to rapidly improve your skills. And my first recommendation is go to the next lead dev conference. I've been there a few times now and it's really good for the new leaders in technology. It has both technical sessions and behavioral sessions and the organization is much more than a few conferences as well. They're an active community with blog posts, they have a YouTube channel, they have meetups, they even have trainings for entire teams. It's really recommended. And then there's four books I want to recommend. The first of which is Staff Engineer. There's not a lot of reading on the differences between staff engineer, a tech lead, a principal engineer, an engineering manager, or software architect. But this, is, this book is one, and I loved reading this because it talks about how all different companies are, are interpreting this role and are executing this role. Besides putting your role in a bigger context, it also has a whole bunch of practical tips on how to be a good tech lead and how to be a good engineering manager. And the next book is Crucial Conversations, which states that the most difficult conversations are the most important ones to have. It talks about the concept of the whole self, which I've mentioned before, and how to truly build a connection with somebody, how to truly get to know somebody. And then it also discusses conflict resolution and how to have conflict resolution in high stakes conversations. And the next book is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which talks about five anti-patterns in a fictional team. It is a fictional story, but these five anti-patterns are very common things that you see everywhere. Then it discusses and shows tactics to how you can become a cohesive team, how to build trust, how to have healthy, constructive conflict resolution in your team. And the last book is called Multipliers. It's about how you can get the most out of your team by multiplying their talents. It shows behaviors that can make you an accidental diminisher. The book is centered around the concept of are you a multiplier or are you a diminisher? And it starts with the premise that most people start out as a diminisher and have to actively learn to become a multiplier. And that's it. This was the first video. I hope you liked it. I hope this was helpful. In the second video on engineering management, I will zoom out. I will look at the bigger picture, what it means to be a manager on the long run. When your team grows, when the pressure increases, when your agenda starts filling up, then what? But now I'd like to hear from you. If you have any thoughts, please leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.